Now, Christian friends, the title of my talk tonight is Karl Barth, 1886 to 1905, and Neo Orthodoxy. And it may seem that this subject is of no importance, but I think you will see very soon uh, that it's of considerable importance. Frankly, I'm astonished that there are so many of you here tonight. And I took it more or less as read that as there was a Garston meeting and an Egbeth meeting, and because the title had been announced, Karl Barth, that there would probably be me and Mr. Creswell. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. And I do hope that although some of the things we're going to look at are difficult, uh, that you'll see very soon the importance of giving at least one evening of our lives to considering this man. Now, the Christian world today is terribly divided. And by Christian, I'm using that tonight in the loosest possible sense of the word. People who claim to be Christian. Now, the Christian world is very divided. The ecumenical movement is always telling us this. You Roman Catholics shouldn't be divided from you Anglicans. You Anglicans shouldn't be divided from you Methodists. You Methodists shouldn't be divided from the United Reformed Church or whoever it is, the Baptists. <coughs> And yet the real divisions in the Christian church, friends, are not divisions which run along denominational lines. This is something that the ecumenical movement has overlooked completely. The real divisions in the Christian church are differences between <coughs> those who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible is the only Christ and those who don't. The real divisions are between those who believe that there is a triune God who is self-revealing and those who don't. The real divisions are between those who believe that this world is the battleground for spiritual warfare and those who don't. The great divide is so great that although there are many things which call themselves Christianity, in fact there are only two sorts of Christianity. And those two sorts of Christianity are in fact not two forms of Christianity at all. They are two religions, as Gresham Machen long ago pointed out. The simple issue is this, shall we believe the Bible or not? And that is the real divide which runs throughout Christianity. And there are some who say, yes, we shall believe the Bible. And there are some who do not, the vast majority. Now, it's ever since the end of the 1700s that the vast majority of so-called Protestants have by and large increasingly and consciously chosen to have a religion which is not based upon the Bible. A great revolution took place at the end of the 1700s in thinking. Up until then, most Protestants believed that our religion must be based firmly and squarely upon the Bible. But from that moment onwards, they decided that they would have a religion which wasn't. Now, the man responsible for this great change was Immanuel Kant. Nothing to do with Karl Barth yet. <laughs> Immanuel Kant. And all modern religious thought which calls itself Christian but which is not based upon the Bible, really does stem from Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant arrived on the scene and said, it's about time mankind grew up. We have a self-inflicted immaturity. It's about time we left it behind and we all grew up. It's about time, he said, that mankind came of age. If you've heard this sort of talk, you may not have realised it, but it came from Immanuel Kant. Don't rely, he said, on any authority exterior to yourself. In other words, don't believe anything simply because it's been told you. Dare to use your own understanding. Think things out for yourself. Start from scratch and come to your own conclusions. That's Immanuel Kant. 
Now, come with me to Genesis chapter 1. I beg your pardon, Genesis chapter 3. And you'll see that Emmanuel Kant was in fact not saying anything new at all. Verse 1, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? Now that was the spirit of Kent. Hath God said? Has God really spoken? Don't believe a thing just because somebody else says it. Start from scratch and think things out yourself. The spirit of Kent is also verse 5. God has know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right there, even in Eden, the devil appealed to man's desire to be wise. And Kant said, it's about time we left behind our immature thinking, and we all became wise. So, he says, be released from all the controls over your own thinking. Reason and reason alone is adequate to explain this world. Reason and reason alone is enough to understand what lies behind this world. You don't need to keep to the old ideas that God has spoken and that his message has been inscripturated in the Bible. You don't need that sort of explanation anymore. Think it out for yourself. And if you can't explain to yourself what lies behind this world, then at least ask yourself the question, what seems reasonable? And use that as a working hypothesis. It doesn't matter whether what you think is reasonable is really true or not, as long as it works for you. It doesn't really know, well, you can't really be, for, you can't really be certain what really does lie behind this world, but... What seems reasonable to you, as long as it works for you, will be enough. And face this fact as well. That when you look at this world, you won't really see things as they are. Your impression of the world will be different from his impression of the world. And you'll obviously come to different conclusions about most things. But don't get uptight about that. Just let it stop you from being dogmatic. Now that was Immanuel Kant's. And it was that sort of thinking which created the intellectual atmosphere of the 19th century. It was the teaching of Kant which decided that people thought the way they thought during the last century. Shake off the shackles of the past and grow up was the great cry. And that's why, of course, the theory of evolution got off the ground during the last century. It was for a reason like that, not because of its scientific value. Now, all this sort of thinking had profound effects on the Christian church. And by the time we come to the middle of the last century, this is the sort of thinking which is found in almost every church. The Bible is a human book and is fallible. They came to that conclusion because of the philosophy of Kant, not because it could be demonstrated. It's not important whether the facts in the Bible, the facts recorded, really happened or not. As for God, he's unknowable. What matters is the teachings of the Bible. But if the teachings that you read seem unreasonable, that's a good enough reason for rejecting them. And so by the middle of last century, the philosophy of Kant had crept right down into the pulpit and also into the pew. And it's at that point that we start our story. So there's the introduction, and we've already one way through, a third of the way through what I want to say. That, that was the intellectual atmosphere before 1919, the philosophy of Kant, and it's still with us today. You can't understand the modern world if you don't understand Kant, sorry to say, and you can't understand the modern church unless you understand Bart.
Now, in 1919, into this intellectual atmosphere came a whole new ingredient. The place? Switzerland. Of all beautiful places for something so awful to come. Just 16 miles south of the German border lived Karl Barth. In the year 1911, as a young man of 25, he'd gone to be the pastor in a small town there. And in 1919, he published a commentary on Romans. And that commentary on Romans introduced the Christian church into a whole new era. And that's the point that I'm talking about tonight. Uh, again, I stress, by Christian church, I'm using Christian in the largest possible sense of that word. That's one book in 1919 put ideas forward which were so radical that they were described <coughs> like this. A bombshell on the playground of the theologians. Well, sometimes we could do with a bombshell, but that's not the one we want. Or someone else wrote, a Copernican revolution in Protestant theology. And the influence of that one book and the ideas which have come out of that one book have dominated the whole of theological thinking this century. From 1919 to 1981, you have no possibility of understanding why many preachers think like they think and why many churches have gone like they've gone unless you have some at least elementary understanding of Karl Barth. Pa Karl Barth has been right at the very centre of theological discussion since 1919. It's his writings which have dictated the questions and it's his writings which have influenced the answers. He has certainly been the most influential, quote, Christian, unquote, writer of this century. And so influential that when we revised our church constitution about six years ago, uh, we felt it necessary to put some clauses into our doctrinal statement, ruling out the possibility of Bartianism uh, coming into our own church belief. Now, what did Bart say? <coughs> and why has it been so <coughs> significant and why is it so dangerous that's what we're looking at this evening well what Bart said was this man is not growing up Immanuel Kant said let's all grow up all through the 19th century they said man has come of age man is not growing up said Bart if man is growing up, how do you account for the world war? The first world war. How do you account for the barbarity of the first world war? How is it that great cultured nations can fight each other like animals? So that was a real smack in the eye for the liberals, for the modernists. What else did Bart say? God, he said, is holy other. By holy I mean W-H-O-L-L-Y. Completely other. You can't guess what God is like and you can't work it out. And a working hypothesis won't do. There are things which are true about God but we can never discover them for ourselves. God must reveal them. And the way he does it is through the Bible. And there is no chance that you will ever come to know what God is like without reading the Bible. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But wait a minute and you'll see that it's not as good as it sounds, which is why this man is so dangerous. But nonetheless, that was another smack in the eye for the liberals, for the modernists of the 19th century. You can't know God, says Bart, he must reveal himself. Whereas they had been saying for a century or more, man has come of age and we can work things out for ourselves by our own reason. Now, this is then Bart went on to say this, all in the same book. It's possible, he says, for you to read your Bible without reading the word of God. <coughs> 
It's possible for your pastor to preach the Bible and for you not to hear the word of God. Because the Bible is not in and of itself the word of God. But, if as you read the Bible, the message becomes real to you, if as you read the Bible, the chapter explodes into life, if as you read a verse, the verse speaks to you, then at that moment, the Bible is the word of God. Now you can see why I said it didn't sound so good. Because this is a major departure from the historic Christian faith. The historic Christian faith is that even when I'm not reading this book, even when it's up on the shelf, it is still the word of God. When I am reading it, even if I don't understand it, it is still the word of God. It is in and of itself the word of God. Well, Bart went on. You'll never get anywhere, he said to his congregation and in his commentary. You'll never get anywhere unless you grasp that whatever God says to you through the Bible will be filled with paradoxes. I told you it'd be hard tonight, but it's not that hard. God is hidden, yet he's revealed. Everybody has been elected in Christ, and yet everybody is reprobate. We are justified, and yet we're all sinners. And unless your mind is willing to hold contradictory notions both at the same time, you'll never get anywhere in the Christian life, said Bart. We can talk about this later on, because not everything that Bart said was wrong. Not everything. Finally, he said in this book this, there are two sorts of history in the Bible. Now, he wrote German. I don't know any German, but there are, I believe, two words for history in German. But he says there are two sorts of history in the Bible. There are plain facts which you can check up on. And on the other hand, there are facts which can't be checked up on, but nonetheless they're important to you. So you can check up on the fact whether Ahab was king of Israel, but that's, that's a fact of no, in, no consequence. You can't check up on the fact whether Christ rose from the dead, but that's a teaching of immense importance. And he made it plain that the teachings which are of immense importance can't and don't need to be checked up on. If you can check up on a fact, then it's because it's of no particular importance. Well, that's enough for now. The reaction to this book was absolutely incredible. Everywhere it was hailed with enthusiasm. The liberals, by that I mean the modernists, the people who thought that reason was the most important thing in the world, and they forsook their liberalism in their droves. And I mean in their droves, and adopted the teaching of Bart. Whereas the evangelicals, they thought that what they were hearing was a revival of the old doctrines of the Reformation. They thought that this was a revival of the old doctrines of Calvin. And they adopted the teachings of Bart in their droves. Well, both sides should have been a bit slower. What Bart was teaching was not the old liberalism, and the liberals should have seen that. But what Bart was teaching was certainly not the old truths of the Reformation. Because Bart did not accept, Christian friends, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible. In fact, to quote him, he said that to seek for the inf or to, se to seek for any infallible parts in a totally fallible book is mere self-will and disobedience. No, says Bart, the Bible only becomes the word of God as I read it. But even then, I can't know God as he is. When I read the Bible and it explodes to me as I read it, all I read is paradoxes, contradictory truths. So all I can get some idea of the shape of things, I can never speak absolutely clearly about anything. God remains, in the final end of the day, unknowable. <laughs>
said Bart. Well, the other point also is important. As Christian men and women, we contend that the great facts of the gospel really did take place in history. To us it is a matter of immense importance that our Lord was crucified at a particular spot, in a particular day, at a particular time, in front of particular people. To us it is of immense importance that our Lord rose from the dead and was seen and it was historically testified and checked up on that the resurrection really did take place. Bart says anything which really matters can't be checked up on. And in that way he takes away the foundations of the very Christian faith. Well then, let's talk about this incredible word neo-orthodoxy. Bart's ideas, surprisingly, because you can't understand them, can you? <laughs> caught on, spread like fire, were improved, amended, refined, and encircle the globe today. Other spokesmen emerged on Bart's side. They didn't agree with him on every point, and there were many important points of disagreement. And the greatest spokesman of them all, of course, was Emil Brunner, who some of you may have heard of. But by and large, there were a number of features which held the whole movement together. And the movement today is known as neo-orthodoxy. And as I say, its influence encircles the globe. It's been a total menace, even in places like Japan and Korea, where there are basically only pioneering churches. It is the dominant uh, way of thought in all the French Protestant denominations and it's very influential in Britain. Uh, the United Reformed Church is almost totally Bartian. Not quite, but almost totally. The Anglicans uh, are absolutely riddled with it from the top to the bottom. And Methodist after Methodist minister is a Bartian today. And yet thousands of ministers the world <coughs> around are passing as true gospel preachers. And they are accepted as true gospel preachers by undiscerning congregations, whereas all the time they are in fact neo-orthodox. Now could you tell the difference between a gospel preacher and a neo-orthodox preacher? How would you go about finding out, if you were involved in calling a pastor, whether he really was an evangelical or a neo-orthodox? What sort of questions would you ask him to find out? I'm sure most people have never thought about this, and I'll give you an example. Uh, six years ago, as you know, we started a regular minister's meeting here. It's been meeting five times a year for, for six years. One of the men who joined right from the beginning was a Bartian, a neo-Orthodox minister. I knew he was, and Mr. Gregory, the co-chairman, knew he was. Nobody else knew, and nobody else ever guessed. Because although he sat amongst evangelical men, reformed evangelical men, and entered into their discussion with them, the others were not able to detect that he was what he was. He preached in evangelical churches throughout Merseyside and many, many missions, and nobody ever suspected his true colours, because undiscerning congregations are to this hour unable to tell the difference. Now, in the Lord's mercy, after about three years, uh, he realised that the Bartian teaching is quite wrong and moved away from it completely and today is a totally orthodox reform minister. But that was, not the type, that was not the way it was and yet people didn't discern the difference between a reformed evangelical and a neo-orthodox Bartian. They were not able to discern. Now, there are differences between spokesmen in the neo-Orthodox movement, but basically, they are held together by four strands of teaching. First of all, neo-Orthodoxy holds to a certain concept of revelation. I don't mean the book of revelation. If you ought to know anything about God, they say, it must be because God reveals it. Revelation takes place by means of the Bible. 
and you'll never have revelation from God unless you read the Bible and unless the Bible is preached. But the Bible itself is not that revelation. Revelation is not a book. It is an event by which God encounters you through the Bible. Revelation is a meeting. Revelation is a confrontation. Revelation is a dialogue by which God meets with you as you read or study or listen to preaching. Now that is totally different from the Protestant and Reformed faith. We believe that revelation is what God has declared to man. Our final authority, I decide what I will believe and how I will behave by appealing to something outside of me, something objective, a book. But the final authority for the neo-orthodox person is not the word, but his experience of the word. It's not what the Word teaches, it's what happens to him as he reads it. And of course that varies from person to person. So they have a certain concept of revelation. Revelation is an event. Secondly, neo-Orthodox people, despite their differences, are held together by the fact that they all use Orthodox language but they use it in a different way from the way we use it. And this to me is the real danger of neo-orthodoxy. If you listen to a neo-orthodox preacher, he will talk about original sin. Now that is fantastic. Because when you listen to the old modernists who rely on the influences of the last century, they never talk about original sin. If you listen to a neo-orthodox preacher, he will talk about Adam and the fall. Now that's quite, that's, that is absolutely staggering. Because <coughs> if you listen to an old modernist, it, if he talks about Adam, he just pooh-poohs the idea of, of there ever being an Adam. And as, as for the fact that there was ever a fall, well, he doesn't accept that idea. If you listen to a neo-orthodox preacher, he will talk about redemption. It's one of his chief words. Resurrection of Christ and the second coming. Now when did you ever hear a modernist preach on the second coming? But you listen to him carefully. And he doesn't speak of original sin as a fact, or of Adam as a fact, or as redemption as a fact, or as the resurrection as a fact, or of the second coming as a fact. <coughs> he uses all those words, but he doesn't talk about those things as facts. He doesn't talk about them as literal history. He simply talks about them as concepts taught in the Bible which should have an effect on you. He doesn't talk about them as check upable facts. They are just things mentioned on the pages of the Bible which should affect you. <coughs> Terribly dangerous. Now, the third thing about neo Orthodox preachers is they talk about very little else except Christ. Now that in itself is really quite remarkable. If you hear an old modernist preacher, he'll talk about almost anything else except Christ. I had an extract sent to me today, perhaps some of you did because you know the same person, which was an extract from a sermon on life insurance. <laughs> some great Scottish preachers just preached a sermon on life insurance and all the life insurance people are capitalising on it and sending extracts of this sermon around to all the pastors they've ever heard of. <laughs> That's typical modern. That's a typical modernist sermon. That's all they got to preach about is life insurance, or nuclear war, or something else like that. But neo-orthodox people don't descend to that. They preach about Christ. All their sermons about Christ, and they preach about very little else except Christ. God, they say, doesn't reveal Himself anywhere except in Christ. But you'll never hear them preach on this verse. Come to Acts 14, 17. 
Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The Apostle says that God reveals himself in creation and in the ordering of creation and in the ordering of the seasons. The neo-Orthodox person never, ever, ever, ever draws attention to the fact that God reveals himself in creation. He'll never, you'll never find him preach on this verse, Romans 1, 19. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every man has a consciousness of God in himself, and every man knows, as he surveys creation, that God <coughs> is. But you'll never hear a Bartian draw attention to that fact. Ever. God doesn't reveal himself anywhere, he says, except in Christ. Christ is truly God, and Christ is truly man, he says. Sounds great. So ask him about the humiliation of, of Christ. He'll say that's tautological. Because to be a man is to be humiliated. Anyway, so how can you talk about the humiliation of Christ? You'll never talk about that. Not even at Christmas. Talk to him about the ex exaltation of Christ. Well, he says Christ is God. So to talk about uh, Christ being exalted is saying the same thing twice over. He never talks about the exaltation of Christ, of him being raised to a place higher than he was before. Ever. No, he says, I'm going to preach Christ to you. And you can't know anything of God at all. Not even by looking at the mountains or the fields or the rivers, not even in your own conscience can you know anything of God at all until Christ meets you in a personal encounter as the Bible is preached. The key thing to remember about Christ, they say, is his incarnation. His coming amongst us as a man. It's because he was God and man together that he's bridged the gulf between heaven and earth, between God and man. And when you hear a man preach about the incarnation, the incarnation, the incarnation, the incarnation, and never preach upon the cross, you have met your neo-Orthodox preacher. That is his great theme. The gulf is bridged between God and sinners, not by the cross, but by the incarnation. That's why I read the passage that we read tonight, for a number of reasons. And Paul makes it plain that when God calls people, he calls them through the word, but it's the spirit working through the word. Paul makes it clear that when he preached, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to those who are being saved, the power of God. And it was the cross, the cross, the cross, which was always central in Paul's preaching. When you hear a man who sounds like an evangelical, but he doesn't get you to the cross in his prayers, and he doesn't get you to the cross in his preaching, but he preaches out Christ all the time and hardly any other theme, then you've probably met one of these people I'm talking about. No Barthian ever preaches on Romans 5.10. Never. If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life because their teaching is that we're reconciled to God by the birth of his son. No Barton ever preaches on these verses in Colossians. Colossians 1.20 Having made peace through the blood of his cross, because he'll say, having made peace through the birth of the Christ. Or look at verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, It'll be in the body of his flesh through incarnation. <coughs> the final feature which binds neo-orthodoxy together is that it is ambiguous 
concerning universal salvation. It doesn't speak with a clear voice ever about whether people are all saved or not. If you listen to a preacher and at the end of the day you still don't know whether everyone's going to be saved or not, he seems to be suggesting that everyone's going to be saved but he never actually quite says it. You've probably met one of these people. Because Bart taught and here's the hardest bit coming now Bart taught that the only person ever elected by God the Father was God the Son and that every single person is elect in Christ I don't know what he means either but some people have been fooled a preacher gets up and preaches the doctrine of election and they think ah the old Calvinism has at last been revived and it hasn't he talks about people being elect in Christ being chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and it sounds, it sounds remarkable until you listen a bit more closely this is how a Bartian sermon goes the only person ever elected is the Lord Jesus Christ all of you are elect in Christ all men and women everywhere are elected in Christ so but the trouble is that some of you don't live like elect people I have come here today says the Bartian preacher to tell you that you are all elect people and that you should all live as elect people so immediately some bright spark asking the question well what happens to those who don't live as elect people well the orthodoxy never tells you all it says is we have no right to limit the loving kindness of God it's always its standard answer is anyone going to be lost pastor we have no right to limit the loving kindness of God is anyone damned pastor we have no right to limit the loving kindness of God and yet when evangelicals hear Christ preached Christ preached the doctrine of election the doctrine of election they think this is good old reformed theology but it isn't the preacher never tells them that it is damnably serious to live a life of unbelief the preacher never warns them of the peril of apostasy he never preaches heaven as a reality he never preaches hell as a reality the whole effect of his sermon is to tone down the serious situation that the sinner is in he tells people that they're all involved in what Christ did but he doesn't stress that they must repent for their unbelief and their wickedness he doesn't tell them that they must believe or perish there is no urgency about his biblical preaching he doesn't address himself to the fact that their eternal destiny depends upon their response to God's word but he looks to the undiscerning like an angel of light but in fact it's another gospel and I personally believe that Bartonism is one of the most insidious evils of our time it looks so much like the real thing and it's found so often amongst the real thing and so you can see that however difficult tonight's talk may have been it is right that from time to time a note of warning should be given about this subject lest this sort of teaching infiltrates our own minds without us noticing